It's an interesting point that you raised. <clears throat> the, the referendum actually has been allegedly generated by members of the public, the Aboriginal community allegedly. And there's been various Aboriginal government agencies that are behind this and that they are the actual ones that are generating this. And it's been, it's been generated for a long time. So basically, these agencies that have these huge budgets that are failing the Aboriginals, and now, as a result of that, they're saying that if you put this voice into the Constitution, that somehow the money that we use that's generated by the voice will make a change. So I'm not sure how more than $4 billion a year currently can change. But what's going to happen? Are they going to double it? Are they going to triple it? What my concern is, is there, and as you saw from the Thomas Mayo video that we played earlier, they're going to create a new parliament. And that's what the concern is because these people that are behind the voice are unelected bureaucrats and they will be advising the parliament. Now, allegedly, the parliament do not have to take that advice on board, but I can't see them refusing it, especially if we have a Labor government, because there's a particular agenda. And the agenda is the abolition of property rights which is one of Labor's core party principles. So there's also, I've, I've watched a, a recent 60 Minutes show and one of the, uh, one of the uh, architects as well, he was saying that I want to dispel a few myths that um, the voice will generate uh, an indigenous tax. He said the voice has no powers of taxation only the parliament has and i bet you're going to provide that advice to that parliament so that they can engage that power i'm not saying that they will but that is the way that it can be engaged so the voice provide that indigenous tax uh, request and the parliament would provide for it now I don't see, see this is what they're doing, there's this deception going on. No one, <clears throat> no one's acting with integrity and they're hiding behind plans that are yet to be revealed. And some of them have been revealed, but this is the thing, it's the unknown. And when it's the unknown, I know what I would do, I would not vote for it. But that's me. Your decision is your decision. I can't encourage or discourage you to vote in a particular way, okay, that's up to you. All we can do is present the facts as we've seen them. And then it's up to you to make the choice whether you think those facts are factual or not factual. As far as I know, everything that we've presented today is factual. Anyone else? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> If we're going to look at any referendums, we have to look at the history of referendums. Uh, the first one, of course, established the Commonwealth and established Federation. And then we need to look at the particular section of the Constitution, of Clause 9 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth. And we need to look at Section 128 and see whether, in fact, the Commonwealth has been providing uh, a referendum specifically bound to that section of law 
and unfortunately it hasn't. If you look at the third paragraph in section 128, the last word is suffrage. It's S-U-F-F-R-A-G-E. If you look up the meaning of the word suffrage, it means by right. And in fact, the meaning of that word suffrage comes out in section 41, which deals with elections. And it says very clearly, I think we've got a broken flat battery. We have it. Thank you. Uh, when we go to um, section 41, it deals with a, a by right. So nowhere in the Constitution is there a head of power that grants to put you, the voter, under duress by setting up a compulsory form of registration to vote and then compulsory voting. And this would flow through to state government and local government. So there is no permission, and no authority, for any level of government to impose compulsory voting. Now in 1915, the Commonwealth passed a law called the Compulsory, and in brackets, Referendum Act 1915. And this now flows through to the Commonwealth Electoral Act and every Electoral Act in every state. So there is no constitutional permission to conduct a referendum putting the voters under duress. There is no authority. But in this particular case, we have to sort of make this choice and say, well, gee, either we vote in this referendum and we vote according to maintaining this constitution, or we're going to lose the lot. So now that you're of knowledge of what I've just said, of course, we hold the ultimate authority. So therefore, we have the ability to then call out our particular state and uh, federal attorney generals as to where they get, where can they provide the instrument, can they provide the head of power that allows compulsory voting and compulsory registration for voting. And of course, uh, having done a few FOIs myself, we know what the answer will be. So we need to get on top of this. Like I said earlier in my talk, too many of us have been complacent with our, our standing as the highest authority. And we need to be quite vigilant now. We need to take back that power. There's also uh, two other issues in relation to the referendum. <clears throat> the first one is that in 73, Gold Whitlam removed the word Commonwealth from all uh, legislation in, finally, in the Commonwealth. So having removed the government itself uh, not having the power of the Commonwealth Constitution, that's one problem. The second problem is section 128 talks to the Constitution as it is today. There is nothing in the Constitution that allows anyone to extend it. They are proposing to put section 128 is the last section in the Constitution. They are purporting to be able to add a 129. I don't see any power or jurisdiction uh, within the Constitution for them to extend it. The other thing, just uh, <coughs> while I'm talking about the voice, in 1970, an Indigenous uh, entity was set up, and that is the NIAA, if you want to write it down and check it out. So, N 
Additionally, you've probably heard Anthony Albanese's reaction to the poor rating of the referendum and that it's most likely going to fail. And he said, the power already exists in the Constitution and I'll go ahead and enact the laws anyway. Well, if that's the case, what's the purpose of the voice? So secondly, in the Anti-Discrimination Act, which is the... Uh, the, the covenant <clears throat> that they're signed onto and bound by by treaty. It says that any laws that are discriminatory, the government has an obligation to amend or repeal those particular laws. Now, Section 5126 of the Constitution is the provision that Anthony Albanese refers to, and it's a power to write laws for special races. Now, that means that you can write a law either disadvantaging or advantaging a particular race. That's discriminatory. And the government have an obligation to repeal that law, which they're going to rely on if the voice doesn't get up. So you can see once again, my message is still the same. The government are the racists, not you. They're the ones creating the division. Okay, it's quite simple. There's, there's a lot of, uh, I'll call them conspiracy theories. When the Constitution was enacted in 1900 and came into being on the 1st of January 1901, received royal assent on, I believe it was July the 12th, and it was proclaimed in September and then it came into being on the 1st of uh, January 1901. It's not an act of 1901, it's an act of 1900. Okay, you can go and have a look at the original constitution, you'll see it's got 1900 all over it. Now, when that constitution came out, there came out a copy of what's known as the annotated constitution. I believe that's what you're referring to. The red covered book versus the current green covered book. So the original red covered book is the constitution as it was enacted and the annotations, so it's basically pulled apart sentence by sentence and given a structural meaning. Since 1900 and the enactment of the Act, there's been referendums and the constitution has changed eight times, I believe? Six or eight times. Yeah, around about eight times. I think, I believe there's been 48 referendums and there's only been eight successful ones. 
someone wants to look that up and correct me, I'd, I'd be grateful. Now, those eight changes have changed case law as well. And the current green one is a version of the red one with those changes within them. Because if you bought the red one, and I've got the original, I've got an original pressing of the original annotated constitution. And when I go and look at that, like for example in 1947, I believe, or 1949, the Commonwealth enacted section 5123A. So if you go to the original red one, you will find no trace of 5123A. It's a very important provision. And there's been much case law on that particular provision. When you go to the green one, you can actually see that change and you can reference the case law within the pages of that particular, or in regards to that particular provision that's been inserted. So that is fundamentally the difference. There's a lot of people running around saying that that, that, that words have been changed. I've seen no evidence of it, but I'm happy to listen to it and have a look at it. Um, so I, I look at it like this. The, 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 the red covered one is of great historical significance because it is the original version. And the green one is the most up-to-date version with the fundamental changes to the constitution and references to the case law that shaped the common law in Australia. And in 75, there was a number of questions put to the Australian people in referendum, and one of those questions got up, and that was casual vacancies in the Senate. Now, the question incorporated um, the words political party, and as a result of a yes vote, those two words then were inserted into the changes of section 15 of the constitution. Now the, the question was not relating to political parties and yet because those words were in the question, because the question was about casual vacancies in the Senate and because those two words were in that question, they then put them into section 15. There is no other section in the constitution, no permission for political parties. You are, it is your representative in your parliament. There is no barrier of which political parties have been playing a heavy role ever since. So I believe when we correct this system, and we will, we need to go back to section 15 and remove those two words because they are foreign to that constitution. Yeah, I, I agree absolutely, totally. Uh, and the reason is in section five, uh, as the uh, constitution is going around, maybe the light is a little low, but in, in each section, of the Constitution, the wording in the section actually has small numbers over certain parts. And in section five, there is a number, and I think it's uh, 230 something, no, 230. Uh, and the, the wording that is being explained is, and all laws. And it speaks very clearly that for a law to be valid in conjunction with the Constitution, it has to be expressly delimited within the section, which is exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It can't, can't be there. Could we now, get a battery one for the uh, lights? Hands up, there. How many people know about Sorry, Bill number nine? South I know what are they there? Double A's, I think. This year. I believe. Which what's the 
Okay. okay. South dirty. Australian mm -hmm. Parliament. What? What is dirty? Uh, passed the Wallace Mine. Uh, oh, bill uh, well, it's actually an act now, Act Number Nine of Twenty Three, First Nations Voice. Yes, and that actually expressly uh, <laughs> gives the Indigenous Committee the right to attend uh, cabinet meetings on any act that they believe uh, is impinging on their rights. There will be, if it proceeds, and there is a big if on, on that, uh, your doctor here in South Australia is challenging it in the High Court. His first application uh, was rejected, and uh, I got messages to him uh, that in actuality that is normal procedure, and he is required to uh, fill out a form 31 which puts him in the High Court. And approximately 80 applications on form 31 are heard in the High Court. So it ain't there yet, but we're working on it. I didn't hear the question. You didn't oh. say the same vote. Yeah, but with, with regards to oh, the Oh, my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. Old times. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, there are two questions. The first question is, uh, do you support the... Uh, the... Uh, the uh, First Nation oh, yes. Torrent, no. Do you recognise? Do you recognise? No. No? It says, do you support the... Uh, Torres Strait and Indigenous people. That's it. That's the question. The second question is, do you support altering the Constitution to include the voice? Now, there's a teensy weensy bit of problem with that. Because uh, the Constitution requires uh, that prior to altering the Constitution and having a referendum, the bill with the exact wording that is going into the Constitution must be the question. So they're not actually putting what they're going to alter the Constitution with or add to it. So the, the whole referendum does not comply with section 128 of the Constitution. So it should say words to the effect of, uh, do you agree to alter the Constitution to the following? Yes. And give that back. And, and again, it has to expressly delimit what the power and jurisdiction is. The the, the, the major power and jurisdiction of the Constitution is found in Section 51. That's why it is so long. Section uh, 5 also of the English Act, that bit of the English Act, also uh, states that... Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, Yeah, the, the, the powers have to actually be there in the wording. And you can't take the wordings from section 100 and say it applies to another section. 
or you can't take the meaning of the words in one section and say that that means the same thing in another section. So the exact words that will be inserted in the Constitution have to be in the question. And do you agree with including that voice in the Constitution has no power and no jurisdiction? It has to expressly say what the power is and where the jurisdiction is. So, yes and no, or yes and yes, or no and no? Because answer no, different Sorry, it has to be no, like I support. <laughs> I've got friends who are being adopted as an uncle in, in full Indigenous people. I've, I've been adopted into a, a family at home, right? And they, I am genuinely their uncle. So, even though I, I support the Indigenous people, I will be voting no, no. Well, the Constitution uh, is being questioned on the 14th of October. These people who are running this de facto system uh, at the moment are sitting on the right side of the fence in order to try and get across their message and make changes to further empowering their de facto status. So, you know, it's, it comes back to you. It's, it's not up to the three of us. It comes back to you. You're the voice. You're the highest authority in this land as granted through the preamble. You're it. It's a body politic that you need to enliven. You, you need to keep alive and you need to keep pressure on your members of parliament, both state and federal, and call them out. Uh, too, too many times when one or two of us question uh, members of parliament today uh, relating to the 1973 debacle. Um, oh no, I'm not interested in that. I'm more interested in um, funding for a particular um, part of the community. Well, no, we've got to really stand up and say, no, it's not good enough. You're bound, you've taken an oath to that constitution. We want to see you perform exactly as that constitution dictates. And you're the arbiter, you're the power. Exercise that, please. You know, this is what I've been doing 22 years, trying to wake the people of Australia up to you know, where that authority lies. I'm not going to stop doing this until such time, and I guess is when they put me in the ground. But um, essentially, this is your responsibility. We're just here to remind you of that. Can I also add to that, not necessarily the voice, but uh, Rod Cullerton and I, as two former senators, are taking a petition around, and the petition calls for King Charles's uh, ministers assembled in Commons, and the reason. Uh, it has to be Commons, is the Magna Carta transferred the ultimate sovereignty from the sovereign to the people and the House of Commons is the House of the people. So we are asking the ministers assembled in Commons to prepare documentation for King Charles to declare the Governor-General's position vacant and, uh, and appoint a person so he 
will have to point you person to the, the position of Governor General. Same with all the states, that it will be the Governor General who will put the, the names of the state governors forward to the Home Office for King Charles' uh, assent. So then we're asking that any person who has sworn or affirmed an oath to the false Queen of Australia are ineligible to stand for public office. Then we're also asking the same thing, any person who has sworn or affirmed an oath to the false Queen of Australia are ineligible to sit in the House of Representatives or the Senate because they have actually offended Section 44 of the Constitution. So there is a remedy. It's not a quick one. This is going to take us and well into uh, early next year. We will get 40,000 signatures, absolutely no problems whatsoever. So the House of Commons has to acknowledge uh, the actual uh, petition. We are aiming at 100,000 signatures. And just to let you know, uh, that's um, two, two packs of 500 pages with 10 signatures per page. Uh, and it looks like I'm going to be the one that's got to cart that to London. So, um, yeah, so on reaching 100,000, then uh, the House of Commons is obliged under their, the English Petition Act uh, to debate the petition. So there's your answer. That's the remedy. It's over on the table. Not only sign it, but if you would like to take half a dozen uh, copies with you, take them to your groups, uh, walk your street, explain to them why we're doing this. Uh, the actual full petition, it's four pages, um, is, is on Rod Cullivan's uh, GAP website, website. As soon as I can arrange it, I will have my the silent majority, God or God AU, uh, have it up there as well. So that's what we're setting out to do. Uh, we served on uh, Governor General Hurley at his residence on the 25th of January last year, uh, a petition of 10,000, and the next day he left Australia. So they do work. Overseas. <laughs> okay. Uh, I understand your question to be how do you reverse the removal of the Commonwealth in 1973? Is that what it is? Okay, I thought so. Well, that's how. 100%. Um, what's occurred is in 1973, you've got to understand the word art, and it's similar to what we spoke about earlier in regards to Norfolk Island, in regards to a geographical sense. The, the Commonwealth itself was removed. And the way it was removed, well, it was left dormant, it was removed from every single act because they say it was an obsolete word. And what they did is they, they created a title for the Queen and the application for that title was in regards to Australia and its territories, a geographical location, and not the Commonwealth of Australia, the body politic, you, the people of the several states united in one federally dissoluble Commonwealth. <clears throat> so with the, 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 the dash of a pen, they've basically, by using word art, applied the title of the monarch to the land, to the geographical location, 
and no longer to the body politic you. So it could be done the same way, but we would have to ask the monarch to be involved and they would want to, even though the minister must give them the advice and the monarch must take the advice, whether right or wrong, I believe in regards to the royal styles and titles, the, the royal styles and titles are actually a prerogative right of the monarch. So they're a right of the king. And they're not a right of parliament. Parliament can just present it to the king and the king can say yes or no. In 1973, you can go and have a look at the secret conversations between Gough Whitlam and the queen. And you'll see that there were certain things in the title that she refused to remove and other things that she agreed to. But fundamentally, she did agree. So the same process would have to occur. Or there is this process, but fundamentally it is the same process but going via the House of Commons. In the plea of Brummer towards 1931, uh, Britain became concerned and so did Australia and all of the Commonwealth countries that the previous process of uh, acts needing to go to uh, Commons to, be, to get the tick uh, was too slow. So the Declaration of Westminster was agreed to by all Commonwealth countries then. Uh, it was either Iceland or Greenland was a Commonwealth country. India was still a Commonwealth country there. And that, so under that agreement, all of the Commonwealth countries attained their right to pass bills to, through to the Act stage and also to enter into uh, uh, foreign agreements. However, there is a <coughs> <coughs> in the uh, Declaration of, of Westminster, save for any bill that touches the royal styles or signet is void. So what did Whitlam do uh, in, in that period? He altered the royal styles and title. But under the Declaration of Westminster that required the consent of all of the Commonwealth countries, and you're absolutely right, and the Parliament of Great Britain. And just the last thing I'll, I'll add, when we're referring to the Crown, the Crown in actuality is a tri-Crown. There are three parts to it. It is the Crown of England, the Crown of Ireland, well now it's only Northern Ireland, and the Crown of Scotland. So all of those entities have also have to be individually consulted for the royal styles, title and signet to be altered, and they were. Oh dear, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, I actually wanted to thank the people who organized today and um, everyone involved. I wanted to actually say, oh, sorry about your numbers. I was involved with um, a counterfeit um, group, and I just found out today because I made a few new friends. Um, so don't be afraid to admit when you are going a different direction. Also, this is overwhelming. I, I spoke to a few 
I applaud you. I applaud you, and I'll tell you why. Because everybody needs to take a leaf out of this young lady's book, because she's talking about it to people. And she spoke about it to a friend who didn't know about it, and all of a sudden there was someone else that overheard. And that's why you need to speak about it. And you need to speak about it all the time. To be overheard and to generate conversation. It's a deception. It's basically a way to wave the sympathy flag towards you. So you can't say yes to one and no to the other. And I believe what the, that's what they're praying on. Before we go, I'd just like to thank um, my good friend, Len Harris. You know, that, that information about about the box with the fee symbol. Yes. Don't forget that. Anyone you know that's going to buy a house, inform them. And once again, we'd like to uh, thank the, pre, uh, the organisers, Aman, and, uh, and we'd like to thank our host, Rob Moist, and, uh, and we'd like to thank you guys for giving up your day and coming along. We really appreciate it.